So going on to uh, our collections at the Science Museum, we're probably best known for Babbage, Charles Babbage and, and his uh, collection of differential engines or differentiating engines and analytical machines. Um, the, the machine in the middle there that you see on, on the right is the difference engine one. That was the machine that Charles Babbage created really to get across his ideas um, about how to calculate, um, or how to mechanise human thought. So this was a, a model that he had on his desk and he would invite people round to come and see his, his calculating machine. Uh, he'd have a lot of uh, parties on Saturday nights and he'd say, you know, come and, come and look at this machine and, and he'd try and enthuse people about um, calculating engines and about the possibilities of mechanising human thought. Um, it was, I mean, he was very much part of the kind of social elite with, in Victorian London, so he, you know, would talk to the great and the good and invite them round for dinner and this was part of, of the evening. Um, in this way he managed to raise quite a large amount of money. He raised £17,000 from the government um, to build what was called the Difference Engine 2. He never completed building this. He, um, he did various designs which are in the archive at the Science Museum but he never actually um, completed building it. And in the 1980s, the team at the Science Museum, um, led by Doran Swade, built uh, the Difference Engine 2. Um, and that was completed for his 200 years after his birth. So 1991 was the kind of opening of, of the, uh, the Difference Engine 2. I'll just show you a little bit of video of that working and explain a little bit about it. So for every four turns of the handle, you do one calculation. Um, the machine works purely on addition. It doesn't do um, division or multiplication or subtraction. It's purely on addition. So it uses something called a method of finite differences to work out um, po polynomial equations. And Babbage's plan was that you know, there were these tables and tables that we use for navigation, for engineering, for a whole range of different, I mean, you probably know from using logarithmic tables at school, um, and that these were full of errors. So Babbage thought, well, if we can create this machine um, that calculates it mechanically, they won't have any errors. And if it prints them as well, um, you know, no errors will creep in when people write down the numbers. Um, so this has over 7,000 parts. And uh, just these these sections that you can see here turning, they're the uh, carrying arm. So they're, what they're actually doing is checking if a cog has got to, to ten, they'll carry the number back over to the next um, next line of cogs. <coughs> and they almost look like a kind of dancing DNA. I think it's. Um, and what you see here at the end is actually the printer, which was added slightly later. Um, so here you see the printing device that enables the whole thing to be completed. That could be printed onto paper, onto papier-mâché or anything. So you could then print that forward into books of tables. So Babbage himself never, never actually saw his machine working, which is a terrible shame. But the Science Museum used many of the same techniques that would have been available in um, Victorian times and actually did all the work to the same tolerances that Babbage would have had to prove that Babbage's designs would have been realisable had he actually ever completed the machine. Um, and it, the work that we did showed that was possible and actually the reason it never happened was probably because he was such a difficult character. He fell out with his engineer, Joseph Clement. They had a big argument about um, the workshop that he asked him to move into and about payment. Um, and he was known, you know, as being a complex character anyway. He, he uh, was, fell out with people who used to play music in the street outside his house, um, was always shouting at them, and so they always used to come and play the music outside his house just to cause problems. Um, so, it's, you know, it's a very nice story um, and set of objects that explain a particular point in, you know, Victorian Britain. 
but also explains, oh, here he is looking rather grumpy. I love this picture. It's about 10 years before he died. He looks very miserable. <laughs> there are some much, much more uh, favourable pictures of him than this one. But this is a proper photograph, so... Um, but the reason he's um, so significant and important to us, I think, is really because of his analytical engine, not because of the difference engine. It's the analytical engine that's believed to be the kind of... Um, has some of the fundamental principles of a computer that, that we have today. So here you have what's uh, known as the mill, which is like the processing part of, the, uh, of today's computer. And you have a store off to this side. So you're dividing up the idea of the processor and the idea of the memory. Um, and that's you know a major conceptual leap in a machine. You've also got um, input and output devices with the punch cards that were used, um, and it was also capable of conditional branching. So you know if X happens, then Y can happen, and you know, it was you know a fundamental kind of leap in thinking about how how uh, how to program or mechanize um, mechanize thought. Or, um, that was never built, unfortunately. There are various plans to do, uh, you know, various universities have approached us about doing a, a, a virtual analytical engine and using Babbage's designs to see whether that would be possible. Um, but given it, how long it took to create the difference engine too, I'm very wary of taking <laughs> that on as a big project. 